1 Peter chapter 4. If you have your copy of God's Word and you're in 1 Peter chapter 4, I'm going to ask you to join me standing out of respect and reverence for the reading of God's Word. <laughs> and, uh, oh boy, here we go. The Scripture reads, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. And as a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray you bless the reading of your word this morning. Father, help us to see the truth of your word. Help us to see the application of your word. Father, may we be challenged in our spirit this morning to live for you, Lord, to do for you, Lord, to honor you, Lord, to give ourselves to you. Lord, you have given yourself to us by dying on a cruel, cold, rugged cross that was never created for us, Lord. Thank you for that sacrifice. Lord, the least we could do, the word says, is to present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. Lord God, may we give our lives to you, Lord. I just pray your blessing on our time, Lord. Speak through me from the pages of your word. Lord, may you penetrate our callous hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, thank you for braving the weather and coming out. If you have a, a cell phone, I'm going to ask you to shut it off. Please turn it off. If you say, you know what, I use it for my Bible, well, you, I'm pretty sure you can still use your Bible app when your phone is in the airplane mode. Matter of fact, I know I can. And if you cannot, it's probably because you have an iPhone instead of a Galaxy. <laughs> Just saying. Amen. In any of that, we are in the book of 1 Peter. We're in chapter 4. Uh, last a couple weeks ago when we were together, uh, we talked about, uh, if you turn with me, if you look with me there, we talked about uh, Jesus preaching the gospel to everyone, uh, to even those who were dead. And we talked about living a life and suffering for doing good, doing well uh, for the Lord. It says, verse 13 says, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. But verse 15 was a key verse. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Set apart Christ as Lord. Jesus Christ needs to be Lord of your life. Lord of all. Lord of all. Either he's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Amen? Lord of your job. Lord of your home. Lord over your marriage. Lord over your children. Lord over your finances. You know, everything under the sun that you can possibly think about, the Bible has something to say about it in some form or fashion. Looking for kitties. Your sex life. The Bible's got plenty to say about that. It, t t it touches every area of your life, from your finances to your sex life, from your children to how you treat your parents. You, as an adult, how you treat your parents. It covers all those things character issues, things that are going on in the deep crevices of your heart that nobody else knows about. The Bible has much to say, much to say. If we regard, if we regard Christ as Lord of our life, Lord of all, then it should change the way we think. Lord of everything, even your politics. If people, you're, regardless of your policy or your parties that you, so, that you line yourself up with, regard Jesus Christ as Lord. Everything else should work itself out. Nothing more dividing. So let's take a look at chapter 4. Chapter 4 says, Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude. I like the word arm. I'm reading out of the NIV. Does someone have a different translation? Equip? Equip? Equip. Nice. Is that what you got, Vern? Is that what you said? Equip. Anybody else? Arm and equip, that's it? Anybody got the King James? Nobody? <laughs> wow, how far we've come. Arm? Okay. I like the word arm. As a policeman and as a soldier in the military, arm means you're, you, got, you got a firearm. That's what arm means. Uh, in, military, in the military, when you enter into a building, you remove your headgear. Your covering comes off unless you're under arms. So as MPs, we'd walk into a building, and we, you could see in the building anybody inside who had a hat on, you knew that person was under arms. 
They were armed. They had a firearm on them. Uh, we had generals and uh, officers in the Army all carry them. They all they carry sidearms. And we had a, a, a Major General Hines. I'll never forget him. Big black guy. He looked like uh, James Earl. Ain't James Earl John. He looked like Michael Clark Duncan. That's what he looked like. The big <laughs> dude from the Green Mile. Big dude. Quiet, silent, and he and a hat. We were like soft caps. You wear helmets in the field. This dude was nuts. He wore a helmet all the time. <laughs> he wore a Kevlar helmet all the time. He walked into the PX and you see a helmet, you knew the post commander was on was inside wow. the PX <laughs> with a helmet on and a firearm. He was under arms. Anytime somebody had a hat on indoors, they were under arms. It was just a, it just that was military rules and regulations. So my point is this, when you're armed uh, on the police department, when we enter into a range house, you have to, you have to uh, unarm yourself, you have to disarm yourself, you have to download your weapon and all that for safety reasons and things like that. So armed, for me, carries a heavy connotation. It means you're, you got firepower, you got, uh, you got a, a protection. I know there's brothers in the church who carry firearms. They have firearms gun permits. And I ask them when they come to church, are you armed? And they, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. I feel real comfortable when they are. Right. <laughs> I really do. I feel good about that. Yeah. I don't know how you feel, but I feel really good. So some deranged lunatic comes in here. We have armed people in the church who are going to take care of the problem, hopefully, before it gets out of hand. Amen. Sometimes I am, sometimes I am not. I'd rather not be. But anyway, can you pull that up for me, James? Back to verse 1. So if we're talking about being armed with a firearm, meaning ready to do business, ready to protect yourself, ready to uh, uh, engage a, a threat or something like that, the passage we just read said, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, therefore, remember we ask ourselves, what is therefore. therefore? What is it therefore? We're talking about the suffering of Jesus Christ and how he went and preached to the souls that were imprisoned in hell. And it says, therefore, since Christ has suffered in his body, being beaten, whipped, and sp to me, the, the brutal beating of Jesus Christ. I don't know how many of you have ever been beat before or hurt. Once you reach a certain point of pain, it, it just doesn't hurt anymore. Right. It's even kind of mental, same way, or, or physical or mental abuse. Once you reach a breaking point, it's like whatever. There's nothing else you can do. But humiliation is something different. It's like, it's like there's always another, a lower form of humiliation. When they spat in our Lord's face, that makes my skin crawl. I don't know if somebody's ever tried to spit on you. It's repulsive. But the Bible says Jesus suffered. He suffered physical, mental, emotional, and even spiritual when he was separated from God Almighty. <clears throat> Jesus Christ suffered holistically on the cross. He says, so therefore, since Jesus Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself, arm yourself. Take up the weapon. Take up the protection. Take up the firearm, if you will. Well, spiritually speaking, arm yourself, but not with a gun. Not with a knife, not with a shield, not with your big King James Bible to beat people over the head, but with what? The same attitude. The same attitude. The attitude of submission. I heard a person once say that life is 10% what happens to you and 90% of how we react to it. It is amazing to me at how much our life can change drastically in one day. One day. Those who were around when the stock market crashed... On Black Monday, they, the life changed. When the bubble busted, what year was that? Was that 08, 09? 08, 09 yeah. Right? And some people's 401k went, brrr, took a dip. Some, your life can drastically change overnight. Tomorrow, you could be diagnosed with some God-forsaken disease. That's right. yep. Your life can drastically change overnight. And then we, you could lose your job or you could lose your ability to work that job, perform that job. Your job can drastically change or your life can drastically change overnight. It is amazing how much your life can change from one week to the next. And we're going to just be tossed to and from with whatever, whatever's happening in our life, whatever the circumstances. No, we're supposed to have joy in the midst of all of that. And you know what? The Bible says you can arm yourself. If Jesus Christ suffered, we can arm ourselves with the same attitude he had. Because he knew he was suffering in his body. He was done with sin. There is no sin for those who are suffering in our body. If you're suffering for the Lord's sake. For those of us who are suffering because we're foolish and done dumb things and inflicted self-inflicted wounds, that's a whole other kind of suffering. 
But when you're suffering for doing the Lord's work and you're suffering in your body and you should arm yourself with the same attitude that Jesus had, because if you're suffering in your body, you're, you're no longer, I am no longer, I have been free. I don't know if you understand that. We've seen that song. I am free to run, right? You know that song? I am free to dance. I am free to live for you. I am free. I've been freed from the punishment of sin. Sin has no, there is no punishment for sin for Jose Burgos. It's a done deal. So I can live my life in freedom now, in the freedom. And freedom doesn't mean you can do what you want to do. It means you are free to do what you ought to do. <coughs> okay, so we should arm ourselves with this attitude saying, you know what? Sin doesn't have its grip on me like it used to have. There was a time where I was going to hell. There was a time where I had no victory over sin. That time is gone. Praise God. And I should arm myself with the same attitude that Jesus had. Amen? And we should walk around feeling pretty confident that we are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires. I am free to live for you. Right? I am free to live for Jesus Christ. I am free to live a life. Their Bible says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. I know that at the end of my life, whether I'm 48 years old or whether I'm 108 years old, I know that I'm going to be in the presence of God Almighty. And God, I long to hear the words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. I know what's awaiting me on the other side. As a result, I do not live my life, the rest of my life, my earthly life, for my evil human desires. Notice it said evil human desires. Evil. Why would the scripture say evil human desires? Is having children evil? There's women who say, I want babies. I want 12. I want 12 kids. Is that an evil desire? No. The Bible says be fruitful and multiply. What does the Lord desire for me, the scripture says? He desires godly offspring. So having, this desire of having children is not necessarily evil. What is evil is when we have plans and we left God out of them. When you want to raise those 12 kids and you have no godly desires for them, no godly aspirations for them, you really don't care. You, you don't care about God. You just want kids. Your job. Does God, is God opposed to you having a job where you're knocking down some serious cash? He's not. And he's not opposed to you having that job. As long as that job doesn't have you. Are you faithful to God whether you're at the $20,000 a year job or the $100,000 a year job? That is what God desires from you. But when you put your work before the Lord and your work doesn't have anything to do with the Lord and you're not doing anything for the Lord, you're not shining like you're supposed to be in those dark places at work. And trust me, they're pretty, they're pretty dark. I don't know of a godly place to work. I don't know many. Anybody? Anybody? If you go and tell me, shoot, even the church. Chick-fil-A, amen. Hallelujah. Chick-fil-A. Yeah. I've been in there, though, and I've seen some ungodly people in the lobbies. Or outside, for that matter. But you're right. There's, they're, they're far and few. God has called you to be a light. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men so they may see your good works and glorify your Father that's in heaven. We have a responsibility. So when we're pursuing these, these human desires... They're evil. They asked, uh, they, in the scriptures, they asked Jesus, good teacher, tell us. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? He says, you, nobody's good but God alone. What Jesus is saying, you have no idea what good is. So your desire, your pursuits of human goals, of human aspirations, may in, at a, on a surface level be nothing wrong with it. But if it doesn't include God, then you don't have the mind. What did Jesus tell Peter? Frank did it two weeks ago. Pastor Frank did it two weeks ago. When I, took, when I pulled him aside and I rebuked him, I was pretending to be Peter. He was pen, pretending to be Jesus Christ. You remember what Frank said? Remember that? Because I said, hey, man, don't say that, man, don't say that. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. the, the, the subsequent verse says, you do not have the things of God in mind. Right. You, you're thinking from a human perspective. You're thinking with an earthly mind when we should be kingdom minded. He says, so don't come to me with that. See, we, we think we know what's good. It's not. See, as a result, as a result, we should live the rest of our lives, our earthly lives, not for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Come on now. Preach it. There's your key, church. We should be living our life in pursuit of God, in pursuit of serving him, living for him. Man, I had a beautiful example of that in my life. I am so grateful to the Lord for the two women He's placed two women in my life that were godly examples of ladies who lived for God. One of them was married to an atheist, my uncle. 
And my, my, my aunt, her name was Luz, L-U-Z. And for years, we called her Lucy. What a travesty. As she, after she passed away, I realized that her middle name was Divina. And her name translated to divine, divine light. This is what she, and that's exactly what she was. She was a beautiful woman inside and out. She was an angel from heaven. Married to my father's brother. I believe God was trying to woo my, my uncle to himself through his wife. and Another one. But anyway. I had that example. This is a beautiful woman. And I had another one. I had two more, actually. God has given me three ladies in my life, beautiful women, beautiful lives, who live their lives, live the rest of their earthly life. I'm telling you, they live the rest of their earthly life. Not for their human desires, but to please God. The second one was my grandmother, married to a man, my aunt, my grandpa, who was not a good man. Uh, he passed. She never married again. She lived the rest of her life loving the Lord, serving the Lord, praying and reading all of the time. Couldn't read. She taught herself to read so she could read her Bible because she lived in a time before we had it on audio cassette. And the last one was my grandma's good friend, Angelita, who we call, she's like my grandmother. She was married to a drunkard violent man who she refused to divorce but she locked him in the basement so he couldn't cause her no grief because he stayed drunk he lived down there they, and, and this woman was a beautiful woman three women with very difficult circumstances one's married to an atheist one's husband's past who lived outside of his marriage for years had another family just crazy stuff Jerry Springer stuff and my grandmother was married to a man like that. I don't know how much she knew, but she never remarried. And she stayed faithful to God, didn't blame God for her circumstances, didn't walk away from God. She suffered through it. And she lived her life and honored God the rest of her life. So did Angelita, which translates to little angel. Same thing, married to a man who was a drunkard and abusive. And then the other one, whose own husband was an atheist and kind of a jerk. And these three women were the were the godliest examples that I've had in my life. And I'm so grateful to the Lord for them. And all three of them are in glory today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 3. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans do, choose to do. Anybody's translation say anything other than pagans? Not a word we use in our vernacular. Devices. <laughs> yeah. Don't spend, read your verse, Kendi. Gentiles. Gentiles like to do. So Gentiles, non-Christians, non-Jews. Anybody else? Gentiles, pagans, another word? Godless people. Godless people. Thank you. That is one we could use today. That fits the bill. We got Christians who live godless lives. <coughs> we act like he doesn't exist or he doesn't matter. We have spent enough time in the past doing, and some Christians, and we're in the present, doing what pagans, Gentiles, godless people choose to do. Living in debauchery. Somebody got a different word for debauchery? Immorality. Immorality. Lust. See, we gloss over these words and we lose what we just think it don't apply. What did you say, Bob? Lewdness. 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 <laughs> Good. Anyone else? Shameless. Shameless. Living in debauchery. Okay, so we have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans, the Gentiles, the godless people do. Choosing to live shameless lives. Uh, what were the other words? Immorality. Immorality. What was it? Unrestrained behavior, buck wild, just off the chain, whatever we want. No borders. No boundaries, no borders. Hey, if it feels good, do it. Sound familiar? Uh -huh. It blows me away. Our culture changes us. You think I'm kidding? If I picked you up and dropped you in Germany or if I dropped you in Japan, it wouldn't be long before you start acting like they do. There's old saying that says when you're in Rome, do as the Romans do. How many times have I heard parents, when I come to their house as a policeman, and I tell them what their kid was doing, what their kid was engaged in, how many times have I heard the parents say, I don't know where he gets that from. He wasn't raised that way. He wasn't raised that way. I'm sure he wasn't raised that way. Our culture changes us. When the church was called to change the culture, instead we participate in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry idolatry 
That's a big word. Idols. What is it that we put before our God? So people will argue that, oh, that's not idolatry, Pastor. Idolatry is something different. I'm telling you, God is to have first place in your heart and in your life. And if he doesn't, what does? Whatever that is, there's your idol. Verse 4. You might know the first commandment in Exodus. Have no other gods before me, God says. But before he says that, he says something important. He says, I am your God. I am the God who's brought you out of slavery. I am the God who's brought you out of Egypt. I am the one. Yeah, I used Moses. Yeah, you know, the, the, the flood and all that water and all that good stuff. Yeah, God says, yeah, all that's cool. and All the fire and the billows of fire and the smoke and all. Yeah, God says, I did that in the plagues. Yeah, God says, I did that. All that's one thing, he said, but I did it. I brought you out of Egypt. I did. Therefore, you should have no other gods before me. Zero. Recognize who is sovereign. Amen. That's number one. What's the second commandment? You want to know? Thank you. Do not take upon a graven image. Do not take a graven image. That's the second commandment. For us, we say, what is that exactly? It's when you, well, they, in those times, they were carving things up. They would say, oh, look, we carved this thing. <coughs> this is our God. They carved a wooden Kleenex box to the God of Kleenex. All right, so we're going to pray, and, and we're going to praise the Lord of Kleenex so that he doesn't cause anybody to get colds. Okay? This I know it's kind of absurd, but this is exactly what it was. They, not exactly, but they would carve a box, a Kleenex box. We're going to pray to the God of colds. We'll call him Puff. We're going to pray to Puff God that none of us will get colds and we're going to offer up sacrifices not to tick him off so that he doesn't call, cause any, any of us to get colds. And God's saying, hello, I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. I am the God who gives you health. I am the God who keeps you from getting a cold. I am the God who helps you get over your cold. You should have no other gods before me. Zero. And don't Worship any graven images. Don't put anything before me. You say, oh, that's cool, Pastor. How does that apply to us today? Well, I'm glad you asked. Many of us think our jobs provide for us. Come on now. God does. God is giving you your job. He's giving you your ability to do your job. And he's giving you the opportunity to do your job. That can change tomorrow. People think, you know, it's my car. People, we put a lot of faith in our retirement plans or whatever. It is God who provides all. Whenever we put those things before God, we are on the threshold, very right on the threshold of idolatry. For be think, they think it is strange that you do not do. Go back to verse 3 because I need to recap here real quickly. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, Drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. So these friends that you have and this people you're hanging around with, this is the kinds of things that they're behaving in. And some of you might be here thinking, oh, my gosh, not me. Okay, maybe you're not part of these orgies or carousing, or maybe you don't drink and it's not drunkenness. But debauchery, we said, was lawlessness or no boundaries, right? We do whatever the heck we want. We do what's right in our eyes and not in the eyes of God. So trust me, you've been there. All of us have. And the Bible says we spent enough time there. Let's get out of there. Let's get past there, Christian. We say we're a new creation. Verse 4. They think, they, those people who are participating in that stuff, think that it is strange now that you no longer plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. Oh, oh nah, he's holy Joe. He thinks he's a, a Bible thumper now. Oh, he's special. He's righteous and I'm not. Yeah. At the risk of sounding arrogant, yes, and I humbly say that. Yes, I am holy. God has separated me from that. God has called me to be holy. I don't plunge into the same things that I used to do. People, you think you're something special. No, I'm not. It is not because of what I've done, but because of who you are, not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Amen? It's a song we sing. We know and understand it is what Jesus has done for us. They find it strange, and then they want to heap abuse at you and, and criticize you. But listen, I'm going to tell you something. My righteousness does not come from me. 
It's been imputed on me by Jesus Christ himself. Jesus has blessed me with his gift of forgiveness and restoration and reconciliation. Jesus has done all of that. I didn't do any of that. I don't deserve any of it. But yes, I am different. And so people should look at you and see difference. But you know what? Most of the people who are heaping abuse on us, verse 4, people want to say, well, that happens to me, Pastor. It happens at work. I can almost guarantee you that that's 90% of the time that is not what's happening to you. The, the, heap, the abuse that's being heaped at you is coming from hypocrisy. Not because you're no longer the way you used to be, but because you say you're no longer the way you used to be and you're very much still who you used to be. Talking crazy, doing crazy things, not living your life to honor God, and they see that. That's the abuse that most Christians are receiving today. In Peter's time, it was different. They were truly trying to separate themselves, and they were catching flack for it. Today, we've wandered from that. We've wandered so far away from that. Verse 4 should apply to us, church. People should look at you and shake their head. And, mm. I told you about the Christian at work who was a, a policeman. Who They were like, man, I remember him when he used to beat his wife. I remember when he used to cheat on his wife. I remember when he used to do this and do that. I said, used to. He don't do that anymore? They said, no, now he's just weird. <laughs> he was normal when he was doing all that other stuff. And it's not normal when you don't. You're weird. That's where the abuse should come from. From a changed life in Jesus Christ, that's typically not where most of us suffer. Verse 5. But they'll have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. We know that Jesus Christ judges. The basis of our salvation, what brings us into the kingdom of heaven, is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection on the cross is what brings you into heaven. Amen? Wow, like three of you believe that. Amen? Amen. Okay, that's everything there, church. What's going to bring you into the presence of God, into the kingdom of heaven, is nothing that you can say or do, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imputed onto you through his death, burial, and resurrection. And the faith you have in it, that's what takes you to heaven. Amen? Amen. The basis for your salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. Amen? Amen. Amen. The basis for judgment, listen, is how we live. The way we live, the Bible says the wrath of God is being revealed. Because of ungodliness and unrighteousness. The way we live our lives, God is going to judge you. Each and every one of us are doomed, dead in our sins because of the way we live. All of us. Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh, not so fast. Steps in, spills his blood out to atone for the sins of those. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And those who don't, they're still dead in their sins because of the way they live. They will have to give an account. They have to give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. Verse 6. For this is the reason that the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in the spirit. That's what I just covered. Verse 7, <laughs> the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. You ever, the end of all things is near. Let's start there. The end of all things is near. People say this was written when, Pastor? 2,000 years ago? And the end is near? How near is it, really? <laughs> and people mock the scriptures when you read that. What the end of all things near really translates to is that it's imminent. That it can come at any time. That is the original translation of that. Here's an example. Nothing else has to be done before Jesus comes. He could show up right now. Nothing else has to be done. So that's imminent. That is near. That is now. For example, if you're on, if you play baseball and you get to first base and you want to come home, you have to go to second base and you have to touch third and then you come home and you strike the plate and you get a run, right? If Jesus is standing on first base, he don't have to go to second. He don't have to go to third. He don't even have to walk back to home. He can magically appear at home. You follow me? That is the implication of this verse. The end of things is near. It could happen at any time. Nothing else. There is no warning. There's no two-minute warning. Jesus is not going to call you and say, hey, I'm coming Friday. Y'all get ready. Doesn't work that way. Therefore, be clear-minded. 
be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Well, that, that's interesting to me, so that you can pray. I just shared in the beginning of service today, I said that most Christians don't take the time to pray. We don't pray like we should, unless the wheels are falling off. You know why? Because we're not clear-minded. Our minds are clouded with all of these earthly ambitions and goals and things that we need to do. We're not thinking about godly stuff until something smacks us in our face, then we're crying out to God. Okay, so we're not clear-minded. We're double-minded, the scripture says. We're thinking about God, but we're thinking about everything else, and God takes a back seat because he's really not that important because everything's okay. The reality is, he says, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. If you're not clear-minded, if you're not thinking about the things of God, you're not going to pray to God. We're not going to pray. And you ever been self-controlled? You ever been, let me ask you this. <laughs> I know a man, I know a young man who has a girlfriend. Uh, his girlfriend gets upset, gets mad. And the first thing this man will tell her, not the first thing, but it usually, sometimes he'll tell her, he says, hey, let's pray. It's the first thing he tells her whenever, they get ups whenever they're getting upset, whenever their stuff's starting to boil over. Is that a testimony? Amen. I wish I could say that. <laughs> Tina, tell him. Tell him, babe, don't I do it all the time? <laughs> I wish I could say that. But sober-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. When we start getting mad, things start boiling in here, you ain't thinking about praying. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, you're not like, Lord Jesus, help that man pay attention next time so he don't cut somebody off and hurt somebody. No, that's probably not what you're doing. You're probably laying on the horn and waving at him with one finger. Be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And all this is, this is real. You know, I preach for application. People want deep theological truths. I'm giving you simple nuggets that you can apply in your life. Because if we can't do that, the deep theological stuff doesn't even matter. The end of things is all near, so stop messing around. Stop thinking about all this other crud that doesn't even matter. Focus on the things that do matter. Stay self-controlled and stay in prayer. Amen? Amen? This is what we're called to do. We don't want to do it unless we're in trouble. Cop pulls you over. Oh, Lord, help me. Now you want the Lord's help? I told you about the dude. I laughed so hard when I saw the video. Guy walked into a, a, a convenience store to rob the place. Dummy. Tries to rob Fort Knox. I mean, they're locked up tight. Give me the money. And the person behind the cabinet goes, psh, hits a button. Psh, this thing like locks down. And he's like, psh, he's shaking the glass. Oh, give me the money. I'm going to shoot you. And the person behind the glass hits the alarm. The guy turns around to leave. Well, he didn't realize when he hit that button, it like locked him and he was caged in. Dude's kicking, trying to break the windows. I said, oh, I mean, he's like an animal in a cage. He's like, oh, open the door. And he's screaming, he's hollering. I'm going to shoot. Dude, you're in a bulletproof cage waiting for the police to come. You know what he did? <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, help me, Lord. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. That's when we remember to pray. When all hell broke loose in your house and, you, and, you got, and we're in your life and you got no other alternative, then we break. We put God in a glass container that says break glass in the event of emergency. Other than that, we tell God, stay out of my way, stay out of my life. I'll call you when I need you. God don't work that way. So the end of all things is near. Jesus can show up today. Therefore, we should be clear-minded and in self-control so that we can pray. When we pray, we ask God to give us direction, give us purpose for our life today. Show me, Lord, what you want from me. Verse 8, above all, love each other deeply. You want to learn deep theological truths? <coughs> learn to love each other. The things we say about each other, the things we say to each other. Somebody just mentioned to me the other day, yesterday as a matter of fact, about Pastor Jack Scott. You guys remember him? Mm -hmm. Pastor First Baptist Church, went to jail for being in a relationship with an underage young lady. <laughs> First thing we do is like start questioning the man's integrity. You start questioning the man's uh, ministry. I had a person ask me, I've been baptized by that guy. Do I need to get rebaptized? Yeah. I mean, these are the kinds of questions that go out. You know what? You know what? Your heart should break for Jack Scott. Mm -hmm. Most of us, it don't. That's what he gets. You know what? Be careful. Mm -hmm. You never know how fast you can fall, how hard you can fall. So, well, not me. I'm not attracted to little girls. Well, maybe your vice, maybe your problem isn't little girls. 
It's something else. Maybe your struggle is something else, whatever it is. It could be you tomorrow. And you know what you're going to want? Mercy, grace, forgiveness. He's already been judged. He's already been judged. There's consequences for our sins. I get it, but you're not the judge. Our hearts should break for these people, and it don't. We look at them, that's what he gets. Or guess what? Did you hear about your next guy? Love each other deeply. If you love them like we're called to, your heart would break. I could promise you this. Those, if, you have a, if you have a child, if you're in here and you have a child, raise your hand. Whether they're born of you or adopted of you or whatever, they're your children. Raise your hand. What is it going to take? Keep your hands up. Put your hands down. What would it take for you to stop loving that ch- If there's any of you with your hand up who thinks there's something that your kid could do to make you stop loving them, keep your hand up. Is there something that your kid could do to make you stop loving them? If there is, keep your hand up. (coughs) Because the love covers a multitude of sins. There's nothing my kids can do that's ever going to make me stop loving them. Ever. Ever. There's nothing that you can do that's ever going to make God stop loving you. Ever. That is the love that God is calling us to love one another with. That's not so easy, Pastor. The way that dude breathes, sitting next to me in the chair, makes me gets on my nerves. Boo, freaking who? Get over it. Get over it. If you love them, <laughs> if you love them, you could overlook those things. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> all right, when you when you first fall in love with your with your significant other. The things that they do are so cute. <laughs> you hear them snore in bed. I shared before, too, about the noises, bodily noises that come from them when sleeping. <laughs> They're so cute. They're cute. Oh. When that love wears off five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years down the road, that snoring gets on your nerves. And those bodily functions, those noises that he's making while he's sleeping, those get on your nerves, too. If you remember the love you once had, I'm telling you, love, the Bible says it, and it's absolutely true. Love covers a multitude of sins. We overlook those things in the people we love. We don't overlook them. We see them. We know that they're, we love them anyway. Right? (coughs) We're willing to do that for our spouse, usually. We're willing, we're, we're glad that God does it for us, but we're not willing to do it with our brothers or sisters. That is a tall order. You want to be spiritually mature? I challenge you to grow in that one. Verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. (laughs) Hey, I need a greeter. Uh, Brother Dennis, do you mind standing at the back today and hand out bulletins when people come in? Nah, if you got nobody else, I guess. Wow. Really? He didn't do that, but that's pathetic. I'll do it. You know what? Forget it. Don't do it. I expect us as members to get up out of our chairs and greet one another during the time of welcome. Make sure you find a visitor. Make sure that person feels welcomed in the church. (sighs) All right, Pastor, fine. (laughs) Dude, sit down. Don't do it like that. Without grumbling. See, arm yourself with the same attitude that Jesus had. It's all about attitude. Is the glass half full or is it half empty? Honestly, I'm amazed at how many people are here today with the cold. Praise the Lord. That's a great attitude to have. You know why? Because I'm pretty sure if I gave you free tickets to go see some concert or something, you'd go. I don't care how bad it's snowing. You'd leave early. You'd drive behind a plow to get there or something. (laughs) So we make time and we find time to do the things we really want to do, what's really important to us. And offering hospitality to one another is what the Bible calls us to do and to do it without grumbling and complaining. Verse 10, each one should use whatever gift they have received to serve others. Here's where I'm going to end here because this is going to get ex- uh, this is it's going to get pretty deep here. But let me cover this with you really quick. Verse ten: Each one should use whatever gift they have received to serve others. Use whatever gift that you have received to serve others. A friend of mine once told me, "Listen, your education is not for you. I don't want to get too philosophical with you, but the reality is, you learn to teach. We learn to pass things on to others." 
I've learned how to be a parent to teach my kids to be parents. I learned how to be productive to teach my kids how to be productive. We learn to teach. We pass it on. We use whatever gifts we have. If I can sing a beautiful song, if I can stand up here and just sing a beautiful song, am I singing for me or am I singing for the hearer? See, the gifts that we have, they're for somebody else. They always have been. But see, a lot of Christians think that they could use the gifts that God, that God has given you. Make no mistake about it. If you have a gift, and the Bible says you do, God has given it to you. And if he's given you this gift, you, many Christians, think they could just use it the way they feel like. It's mine. No. You don't honor the giver when you do that. So he, Peter's saying, look, use whatever gift that you have received to serve others. See, there's a call to serve. That's spiritual maturity. I don't care how much you know. It doesn't matter how much you know. The Bible has called you to serve God and serve people. Raphael shows up and plays the drums. I can't do that. I can't. Trust me, it'll be a disaster. You'd have one... That's probably all you'd get from me. Maybe an occasional... <laughs> That's it. <clears throat> and I don't think that Raphael's going to come up here and stand behind the pulpit and bring a message to you next Sunday either, would you? Yeah, he's thinking probably not. God has given us gift, different gifts. He's given us different talents. And that... People, think, you know, people tell me all the time, Pastor, I can sing. That's my gift. Well, I disagree. I think that singing is more of a talent than it is a gift. But nonetheless, God has given us gifts. He's given us abilities to do things. You ever hear people say, that man's got a God-given talent to play football. Nick Foles, strong, devout Christian, quarterback for the, Los, uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles. Hard to root against the guy unless they're playing the Bears. Where's the WWJD bracelet on his hand? Honors God with his life on the field and off. Leads his team in, huddle, in, the, in, in the huddle and also leads them in prayer before and after the games. A real Christian. Honoring God with the talent that God has given him because that talent is different than a gift. The boy can play some football, as much as I hate to admit it. So use the talent you've received to serve. Use the gift that you've received to serve others. I would say you use your talent for the same reason. Nick Foles is doing that. You see some Christians who do that. They honor God. They serve others with the talent that God has given them. But this passage is talking about gifts. They're two different things. Let's take a look. Use the gift that you've received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks pastor he should do as speaking the very words of God when I stand in this pulpit and preach to you I'm proclaiming God's message to you now many of you know me outside of the church and you say that's you know that's officer Burgos or that's Jose maybe you know me when I was a kid or whatever the case may be that doesn't change the matter the reality is that God has given me an ability God has given me the opportunity. God has given me a ministry. And when it's, when it's my turn, when it's my opportunity to use the, the gift that he's given me, the, the gift to teach or to preach, I should do it. And I shouldn't do it half-heartedly. Up here messing around, and I know a lot of you laugh when I say things, but a lot of the humor corresponds with a point. Okay? And I do that to show you that this is real. It can have real application in your life. Don't ever take that as irreverent. Because when I'm standing up here preaching the word of God, I recognize that this indeed is the word of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with all the strength that God provides. Not whining and crying and complaining or haphazardly. I'll show up and sing because I can sing, but I'm not coming to practice. So that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ to him. Be the glory and the power forever and ever. Now let me back up for a second because I want to share something with you. James, I'm going to challenge you real quick here, and I don't think it'll be a big deal for you. But uh, go to uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 6 through 8. And Jazzy, you have a pen back there? Write these down so he can get to the next ones from there. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He can probably do it all with, with his 88 fingers. <laughs> But 
First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 is the, through 11 is the next one. And the last one is Ephesians 4, 11. Let's start in Romans chapter 12, verse 6. Before I get that, I'm going to reread the verse I just read to you. Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. In loving one another, we should offer hospitality to one another without complaining and grumbling. And each one of us should use the gift that God has given us to serve others. Some people think they don't have a gift. I'm telling you, you do. And some people think they can use it however they want. And I'm telling you, you can't. You better be careful or God will take it from you. The Lord giveth and he taketh away. Got my first one, James? Of course you do. Romans chapter 12, verse 6. We have different gifts. This is Romans. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. Being prophesying is being able to, to, to preach the word of God. Uh, that is a gift of God, the gift of prophesying. Verse, go to the next verse, 7. If it is serving, you think serving is a gift, Pastor? It absolutely is. Some people do it and honor God with every moment, every opportunity, everything they do. They just bring glory to God and they love doing it. Serving is also a gift. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, teaching is a gift of God. Let him teach. Okay, verse 8. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. Encouragement in biblical times is something a little bit more than saying, come on, Frank, you can do it. Woo! It's a little more than that. Right. Encouragement was coming alongside oh, Frank, right. putting my arm around Frank and walking with Frank through it. And Frank says, man, this is heavy. And I say, I got you, bro. I'm going to help you pick it up. That's encouragement. Walking alongside somebody, serving with that person is encouraging. If it is contributing to the needs of others. I knew a guy who gave cars away. At a church I used to go to, you needed a car, he'd throw you the keys. He, he didn't care. He'd give. And I was like, dang, you needed money, he had money. He didn't have a lot of it. Well, he had, he'd give it. And I know people who got a lot of money, they'll give it. I know people who don't got a lot, they will give it. And I know people who got a lot, they won't give you jack. And I know people who got none who can't give you none if they wanted to. But I'm telling you, the gift of giving comes whether you have it to give or not. That is a gift. And I've seen people with that gift, and I prayed to God for that gift because I was kind of stingy. I was not that guy. If it is contributing to the needs of others, giving, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. And if it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Many of you are probably sitting here thinking, oh, they're not the gifts I expected. Those are gifts nonetheless. Amen. Go to the next one for me. It's in 1 Corinthians. People tell me, Pastor, this is the gift that I want. Well, sorry. Let me tell you a quick, <laughs> let me tell you a quick story. I hate grab bags. Hate them. And if we're in church, or we're, you know, the family gets together and says, hey, we're going to grab bag for Christmas. And I pull Frank's name. And Frank tells me, dude, let me tell you what I want. I don't care what you want. Don't tell me what you want. If you want to go buy it yourself. I'm going to give you a gift that I think you're going to like, that I think you're going to use, that I think is going to edify you. I, that's what I'm going to get you. Don't tell me what you want. You want to go get it yourself. For that, here, I'll just give you the money. You go buy it yourself. Why well, wrap it up so you can open it and go, ooh, look what I got. You know what you got. You told me to get it. <laughs> that's not a gift. It's absurd. It drives me nuts, man, which is why I don't like participating in these grab bags. Got the nerve to tell me, hey, man. Sidebar. <laughs> Gifts. So if you desire a gift from God, you can ask him for it. Certainly nothing wrong in asking him for it. But God is going to give you the gift that he, think, that he knows is best for you. Right. Verse 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. To one there is given through the Spirit the, gift of the message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge. Sounds like the same thing, knowledge and wisdom. It is not. not, not. Wisdom is being able to apply the knowledge that you have. But it's given by the same Spirit. But look, it It says, to one there is given the, through the Spirit. One is given the Spirit. So Dennis is given the Spirit of wisdom, and I'll be given the Spirit of knowledge. Go to the verse, uh, next verse. To another, the gift of faith. So Frank, Pastor Frank will get the gift of faith by the same Spirit. Mm -hmm. But I don't want knowledge. I want faith. Can I have faith? Well, back to the grab bag. You get what you get. It's not a buffet. <laughs> it's not a buffet. God is going to give you, God knows you. He created you. Right. 
You think you don't know what gift to give you? Come on. To another, the gift of faith by the same spirit, and to another, a gift of healing. Wow, I would, I'd love to have that gift. I wish I could heal. I wish I could just lay hands on somebody and just heal them. I'm telling you, I'd be in the hospitals putting them out of business. And the, I'm telling you, and the gospel would be spread. I'd cure cancer, and I'd be on a crusade. I'm telling you, if I had that gift, I wish I had that gift. And I would be trying to honor God with it. Because that is one that people, I mean, seeing is believing. You have a family member who's got cancer, and they're withering away, and they're ready to die, and I come and lay hands on them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that person comes, man, come on. that's an impressive gift. It was a sign gift. It was to prove and to authenticate that God was moving. Some people would argue that that gift has, has uh, ceased. I don't believe that it has. By that one spirit, same spirit, verse 10, to another miraculous powers. Do you imagine that? Could you imagine, I mean, the powers that the, that the apostles had? The, uh, the apostle Paul, Judas just fell out of a window in the book of Acts, broke his neck and died. Why am I laughing? It's hilarious to me. Because it was, he, got, he was in the window and Paul was preaching all night and he got tired. He got hot and he yeah. fell asleep and fell out the window. He's trying to cool off. He falls, he breaks his neck and he dies. Yeah. Wow. And I laughed because subsequently I knew what Paul was going to do. Yeah. Paul goes down there and says, basically brings him back to life. Miraculous power. You know why God doesn't give us those powers today? Because God knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He's giving you specific gifts because he knows that those are the gifts that you can use to help edify others. And if you have certain other gifts, perhaps you wouldn't be that person. I don't know. But that's why God does. God knows what he's doing to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits. You don't have a pastor's heart. And I can look at a person on the streets. I can tell the criminals from the good guys. But in the church, it's a little different. Because we're supposed to love everybody. We're supposed to give them the benefit of the doubt. We're supposed to, you know, uh, edify. We're supposed to reconcile. We're supposed to restore. And as a pastor, I got this heart for people. And distinguishing between the people who are truly just tripping over themselves and need help and the person who's just evil and trying to cause mess in the church is almost impossible for Jose Burgos to tell. Almost impossible because I do not have the gift of distinguishing spirits. So God has given me a beautiful gift in my wife who has the ability to distinguish between spirits. And she'll tell me, she'll raise an eyebrow and say, uh-huh. Right off the bat. And for a long time, I didn't believe it. I'd always second guess my wife. And I'd cross check her with somebody else who I knew had the same gift. She's batting a thousand. My wife is never wrong because of the gift that God has given her. She's never been wrong. I don't have that gift. Do I wish I had it? I do. I got it in my wife. <laughs> and the other, the gift of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. Tongues, if you examine the scripture, we've covered this before. If you examine the scriptures, in the book of Acts, tongues is specifically referring to idioms, languages. As you examine, the scripture says that, hey, these guys are speaking in languages. We all understand and hear them in our own languages. So the, the word tongues translated in Acts is referring to languages. And God gave that gift to them at Pentecost for that reason of going out to spread the gospel. There's a reason for it. And he knew they would go and he'd take it with them because of the persecution. Now, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and 14 talk about a different kind of tongues. It is a passage of scripture that is very difficult to interpret because there's not a lot of cross-reference. But in the first, in chapter 13, the scripture says, if I speak in the tongues of angels, the tongues of angels, which is clearly different than the idioms that it's referring to in chapter two, uh, two of the book of Acts. Tongues have, carries a different definition. If I speak in the tongues of angels, so if I do not have love, I have nothing. I'm a clanging cymbal, make a lot of noise, and nobody understands what I'm saying. If you unpack those, so this is a, this is a different type of gift. This is a language, and Paul says it, that nobody else understands. Nobody. Unless you have an interpreter, someone who can interpret it. And somebody, and that's a gift. So if I'm not speaking in tongues, a tongue that nobody understands, it's because God has not given me that gift. Some people would argue that this gift has also ceased. I don't believe that it has. But this tongue that he's talking about here is a spiritual gift that God gives. And the Bible says the person speaking is edifying themselves. There is this connection between them and God that 
quite frankly, nobody else could even fathom. It's between them, unless you have an interpreter. That's what it's teaching. And it is a gift that some have and some don't, just like some have the power to heal and some do not. Some have the power to preach and some do not. Some have the power, the ability to teach and some do not. It is a gift. Right. Go to the next verse. All these are the work of the one and same spirit who gives them to each one of each one as he determines. But I want the gift of tongues. God says, too bad. That's for someone else. And the last one, I say Ephesians, right? 4.10, and I'll finish here. 4.11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, and some to be prophets, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. It is he who gives the gifts. He gave the gift to some, some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Yes. Why on earth would he do that? I'm glad you asked. Verse 12. To prepare God's people for the works of service. Amen. Use the gifts that you have to serve others. So that the body of Christ may be built up. I have to share this with you before I finish, before I close. I have to, I have to, I have to. So bear with me. I promised myself I was going to finish, uh, but I want to share this with you. You got that video, James? Yeah, don't play it just yet. Read, I'm going to read verse 15 with you. Stay with me. Read verse 15 with you, and then I'm going to play this verse, uh, this video. Um, matter of fact, let me just start at 12. Dear friends, this is what I'm going to pick up next week on verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised by the painful tri trials you are suffering, as though something strange was happening to you. But rejoice when you participate in the suffering of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. But if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal. And then he lumps in meddler. He talks about murderers, thieves, criminals. And then he throws in meddler. So the meddler is just as bad as the Someone who gets involved in other people's affairs without warrant to do so. One who's constantly interfering in other people's business. Come on now. Uh -oh. You are just as guilty as the murderer and the criminal. Jesus says if you're suffering because you got a big mouth and you keep sticking your nose where it don't belong, that's not why you should be suffering. We should be suffering for doing good. Now check this out. I saw this video. I have to show it to you. Go ahead, James. Play it for you. I think you'll enjoy it. Listen, or you're gonna miss a lot of the reference. All right, I'm about to call Postmates. Does everyone want the fish dinner? Then we'll just—I'll just call a bunch of them. Jesus is on the way, so just get maybe just get a couple. And he'll take care of us. Okay, yeah. All right, all right. just two then. Two. All right, yeah. Just two. We'll just do two fish. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe like five loaves of bread with it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, perfect. Bro, I just got a Venmo request from Judas. Dude, Jesus just got a blue check mark. How did he get verified? He only has 12 followers. I have way more than that. <laughs> Dude, David is liking and commenting on every one of Bathsheba's spring break pics. What's he doing? I thought uh, he was supposed to be at war. I don't know, dude. Also, what? Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> we can't do that. <laughs> Dude, I'm on Facebook Marketplace right now. Look at this. Joseph's brothers are selling him. Can you do that? What? Oh, Job. He's just going on and on. He said he lost everything. Probably going to get a Kickstarter up oh. soon. Bro, I was talking to Mary and Joseph last week. They were trying to price line a hotel in Bethlehem. Couldn't find anything. They ended up having to like Airbnb some like rustic barn, dude. Brutal. If Noah Instagrams one more time about his DIY project, I'm done. It's too much. Like He's like, I'm getting these instructions from heaven. Oh, yeah. Doubt it. Dude. I ain't getting on that boat. Oh, look, another bachelorette in Sodom and Gomorrah. <sighs> Seen it. Sin City, we get it. Don't look behind you. You know what I'm saying? Because the... What? Okay, forget it. Dude, are you friends with the power of the sun on Snapchat? Have you seen his stories? He just like left his dad's house. He's in just, like another city just losing it. Dude. Insane. Like not safe for work. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, dude, have you heard from Paul in a while? Maybe he's in prison again? Again? <laughs> dude, you want a bite of this? Do I look like Adam to you? Okay. Bro, do you follow the rich young ruler? Is that that SoundCloud rapper? No, it's a guy. Oh. He's always posting about his house and his cars and stuff. He met Jesus last week. Literally haven't heard from him. It's weird. Dude, Jesus came to town on a donkey. I dude. saw that. Could he not get an Uber? I mean, maybe he was surging. <laughs> dude, are you in this group chat with Shadar, Kamishak, and Abednego? Uh -huh. I used this fire emoji. They got all offended. Oh, uh, 
Okay, Jonah tweeted he was going deep sea fishing three days ago. Have you heard from him? Maybe he doesn't have service. <laughs> do you follow Saul? Yeah, what? He changed his username to Paul. What? Bro, do you have locations on for the children of Israel? They're just like wandering around. Literally makes no sense. Have you seen the weather for today? No, what? 50% chance of quail. Weird. Wow. Ah, uh, Abram and Isaac posted a selfie that headed the mountains for a little father-son trip. Amazing. What could go wrong? Uh, Wait, what's that rope for? Uh, oh my goodness, Lot's daughter's pregnant. She's gonna have a baby. No, I wonder who the dad is. Too far. <laughs> Bro, you're following the woman at the well? That's not like that. Check your heart, dude. <laughs> That's funny. You will watch that video, I was laughing. Meddling all up in everybody's business. Now I'm sure, I saw a movie just the other day and uh, it was like a small town and everybody knew everybody's business. I'm sure that's true. Even in biblical times, yeah, everybody knew everybody's business, I'm sure. But this whole social media puts us on a whole nother level. And that's absolutely true. Meddling, meddling. God has given us spiritual gifts. He's given you gifts so that you can use those gifts to serve and edify others not tear people down. I want to challenge you. I'm telling you, if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, I want to challenge you to discover it. Let me know that. I have a spiritual gift inventory. I can help you figure that out. And then we need to figure out how to help you use that gift. But I'm here to tell you, many people think that they don't have a gift, and other people think that they can use it whatever which way they want. And neither is true. God has given you a gift. There's nothing wrong with desiring other gifts, but the scripture is clear. God has given you those gifts so that you can serve others to help build his kingdom.